Do you remember your sex education? Was it helpful to you? Was it filled with scientific information rather than real, practical advice? I'm Diggory Waite, and this is The Real Sex Education. Each week, I'll be joined by a guest. We'll impart our own sex wisdom, ask our own sex questions, and we'll go over all the things they don't teach you in school. To bring this all together, though, we'll need an expert. A sexpert, if you will. But the only sex and relationship therapist I know is my mum. Hello, mum. Hello, Diggs. In this episode, we speak to comedian Cindy V. I'm so excited to be on this podcast. It's unreal. We bond over our therapist mothers. There's some things that my mother did as a therapist, which I think she should have gone to jail, frankly. We talk about biting and not the love variety. Yeah, I was like, he'll bite me. She said, ha, you know, bite. And talk about having sex for the first time in India. I say, you know, in India, when it comes to sex, there's no theory. You just show up one day for a practical and wing it. Hello and welcome to The Real Sex Education. I'm Diggory Waite and I'm joined by accredited sex and relationship therapist, Kate Campbell. Hello, Mum. Hello, Diggs. How are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm very good because it's a great episode today when we chatted to comedian and co-host of the Child Labour podcast, Sindhu V, about her sex education and a lot about her mum, who was also a therapist. So me and Sindhu had a lot in common straight away. We did. Yeah. Yeah, she spoke a lot about um, her mum, but also like she spoke a lot about the differences between sex and relationships in India and sex and relationships in the West, mm. with one of the big differences being arranged marriages. How do you think other parents see me as a potential suitor for their kid? Oh, now that's interesting, <laughs> isn't it? Mm. Yeah. They either, they either love you or hate you, don't they? Your mum might. Yeah, I think people's dads and me always take a little bit longer. But I think mums like me a lot quicker, except for one mum when I was younger. I was about 12 or 13 and one mum said to me, oh, um, my daughter can't marry you because you're the son of divorced parents and that means you're more likely to get a divorce. So I'm not going to be arranged into that family via marriage. I think they did. I think that parents would be delighted with you as a potential partner for their children. Right up until they heard this podcast and then Mm -hmm. they'd be like, sorry, he does what? With who? (laughs) His mum. And she's a what? (laughs) Um, Well, we discuss more about arranged marriages and more with Sindhu in just a moment. But I just want to tell you that at the end of the show, we open up our mailbox to listeners and give you the chance to ask a real sex and relationships therapist a question about anything you like. You can send your queries and questions to my mum via email to podcasts at hatchick.com. That's hatchick with two T's. Or you can use the hashtag real sex edu. That's real sex edu to ask Kate anything you like. We'll get to some of your questions at the end of the show, but before that, we spoke to Sindhu V. And parents of potential partners of mine would be very pleased to know that I started off the interview being very polite and asking Sindhu how she was today. I'm doing very well. I'm so excited to be on this podcast. It's unreal. <laughs> That's great. Are you excited to talk about your sex education? The the thing is, I'm sort of processing it at my own speed. That mm. we're go, you know, it's 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 about what we learned about sex. There's a sex therapist on board, and it's your mother. I mean, <laughs> yeah. wow. Yeah. There's there's a lot going on. But I, my mother was a therapist, but not a sex therapist. But she was also a very Indian mother. So mm. there was no re- she didn't bring the tools of therapy to her interactions with me. As far as you know, as far as you know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And I mean, when, when I got older, I questioned her about it and she used to, she, she did bring some, but I just think this, what you have with your mom going on here is so exciting. Yeah. Exciting, strange. Both have often been said. Um, but I guess we have a lot in common already then. We both had therapists for mothers. But what was your relationship like with your, with your mum? And what was it like having a therapist as a mum for you? Well, I mean, obviously I... It was because she was a therapist or became a therapist very late in my life Mm. that we were so close relative to most Indian friends of mine or Mm -hmm. most friends of mine, but definitely the Indian ones, because my mom and I had a very different equation because I guess she spoke more openly to me. And later in life, when I had left and I was studying, she allowed me to get angry at her, which was not allowed in India. You never answered your parents back. You just never said anything. Mm. But, you know, we had such severe dysfunction in the family. Well, we had severe dysfunction in the family, but we had such severe dysfunction. We had, <laughs> you know, which, of course, as a, as a therapist, your mom will find all the dysfunction, by the way. Yep. 
Like a lot of my friends had the same kind of life and their mothers were just like, you know, don't eat too much, get married. And my mother was like, hmm, let's talk about how we feel about this, that kind of thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? So um, I asked her a lot of questions as I grew up about what it was like to be a mother, to be a wife. And she gave me honest answers, which often reflected terribly on other members in my family. Oh, God. Because my mother's therapy, even though she trained in America and she moved to India to do drug and alcohol therapy, which was very, very taboo in India at the time, mm. she wasn't part of a system. There was no real regulation. I mean, there's some things that my mother did as a therapist, which I think she should have gone to jail, frankly, <laughs> because she got very involved with a couple of women, especially trying to extricate them from really abusive situations. Mm -hmm. But she did it by threatening their families. My mother was a bit of a gangster and my father was senior enough in government that she could do it. I thought that was, I was like, dude, are you allowed to tell them you'll have their house burnt down? She said, I didn't mean it. I'm not going to burn the whole house. So it sounds like having a therapist for mother is slightly terrifying. I think having a therapist for mom is ultimately very liberating. Good. I, well. think, I think when I was a teenager, I was like, what the f***? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. So then let's talk about your sex education because we haven't even... We haven't, we haven't even, even talked, talked about, about sex. Exactly. Yeah. What's happening? I know, I know. So let's set the record straight. What did your sex education look like? I had no formal sex education ever. I've never talked about sex with any of my parents. I didn't go to school where they taught you about sex. So there. Right. Wow. Wow. Okay. That's it. Yeah. Well, Nothing. Sindhu, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. <laughs> I don't know, end. but we knew about sex. Yeah, yeah. You know, in Bollywood movies, people would come to kiss, there'd be flowers, you'd be like, oh. But you didn't know it was called sex. Mm. There was this thing out there and everyone went through it, but no one talked about it or... I went to a convent, man. The mm. nuns were not going to teach us about sex. <laughs> yeah. But I remember it was something. It was just something, but it didn't preoccupy us. When I was between five and 10, I grew up in the Philippines. So obviously a lot of American culture, mm. a lot of American television. And my parents took us to movies all the time, like James Bond. And then something would come on and my mother would just go like this and close my eyes. <laughs> but I remember my sister had a boyfriend or something and my parents lost their minds. So there was something about boys and romance. That's where it stopped. Mm. The other thing you have to remember is our parents being Indian parents of a certain generation, there was no sexual stuff going on. Mm. My mom was very forward, unlike a lot of the other ones. She would hold my dad's hand. She'd give him a kiss on the cheek. And my dad had long hair and wore batik shirts. I don't know what was going on, actually, now that I think <laughs> about it. But, you know, it was all very... In India, marriage is not a... It's not about sex. Marriage is a... It's a relationship you enter to forward your life and to forward the life of the family. Sex is a huge part of it, but it's not the forefront. Love mm. and sex is such a Western thing. Love, sex, sex, love, love, sex. Mm. You know, whereas in India, you start with marriage and then work backwards. And certainly love only happens if you have a love marriage. You know, everything is takes time. I think that's so interesting. It's good because what if you think about it, in an arranged marriage, you're growing into love and in, and in a love marriage, you're growing out of it because most people, yeah, yeah. Most people, once the hormones wear off and you get over the honeymoon period, everyone's disappointed and trying to manage that for the rest of their lives. So it's, that's, that's really interesting. And that was so fascinating to me. And I think it has really helped me sort mm. of navigate my own marriage. I mean, this year I've been married 22 years. Wow. So, Congratulations. Thank you. So, you know, the place of romance and the place of lust and the place of love is an, is an important thing to think about. And I think mm. while my mother and my father and my culture didn't teach me about sex, they taught me about marriage. They taught mm. me about a lifelong partnership in which I think sex plays a part. But there's lots of other things that I got from my parents and my culture that have probably been much more helpful for this partnership. So outside of the home then, what were some of the ways that you learned about sex? I remember there was a girl in my class in Loreto Convent who had a bra mm. before mm. any of us did. And bras were very expensive. And we were like, do you have a bra on? And she was like, yeah, I went to Halvasia Market and got it. And I was like, oh. we were like, oh my God, what's it like? She's like, it's very uncomfortable. And we were like, oh, that's cool. And that was it. <laughs> then we went and did hopscotch. No yeah. one, I think, to be honest with you, 
we were not very sexualized. It mm. wasn't in mm. our culture. It wasn't on our televisions. It wasn't in our movies. But it doesn't mean that it was something that, that was kind of brutal, that we weren't so exposed. Mm. Mm. But there was a lot of talk. There was a general distrust of men. Don't sit like mm. this. Don't do this. This idea that men will look upon you. And they didn't really specify that they would look upon you sexually. They would look upon you in a way that was dark, bad. Mm. Mm. I think it's not uncommon. And I speak only for India. I don't want to speak for South Asians in Britain because I didn't grow up here. You know, there is some amount of inappropriate sexual contact between family members and young girls. And I think that really gets swept under the carpet. Mm. But I remember when we were growing up, my mother once said that. She said, it happens so much within households and it's yeah. not going to happen to my daughters. So what she would do is, I was never at home alone with any help because my father worked in the government. So there was a lot of male help or any male cousins or anything. And my mother was not home. That just never happened mm. to me. And it was, and it was a job. It was a job. Mm. You know, mm. when we were little in the afternoons, she would go to sleep. She slept every, my mother slept every afternoon. And actually as a therapist, you'd appreciate this. When she first started her work in India, she got a hospital where the people could go and detox. It was such a taboo topic and, and addicts were regularly put in mental institutions, right? Mm. She didn't think that was right. So after they dried out, they did their 28 day program. She got a hostel kind of situation, but they did the whole day in our house. Wow. So initially when it started, I was away. I think it was summer holidays. And then I came back and in our garden was this group, the round group of like eight people and my mother. And I remember like after a week, I would just come around the back and be like, okay, whatever. And no one really, no one ever said anything. And then one day I came back and she said, oh, come here. I have, I came back, I was in the first year of university and she said, come here, I have to go have my nap, go and sit in the group. Otherwise they will run away. <laughs> I was like, what? And she said, they will run away. And you know, because they're all addicts. <laughs> and I, I, I was so, I was like, well, what am I going to do? She said, but if they try and run, say, please don't run. She's going for a nap. She'll be back in one hour. So I went and I sat there and they were all maybe, they were quite young. So they were in their late 20s, mm. early 30s. I was 18. They were very intimidating. Yeah. And I just sat there. And then one of them looked at me and said, you're Mrs. V's daughter. And I said, yes. And also I didn't know what addiction was. I'd never heard of it. Mm. I knew that people who drank kind of just fell into a gutter and died. I didn't know what addiction was. I didn't know any addicts. So I said, yes. And then I looked up, there was one woman and there was these guys and they said, so what do you study? And I was like, oh, I study political science. And they said, oh, okay, fine, blah, blah, blah. And then one of them said, do you smoke? And I was like, no, of course I smoked. I was like, no, <laughs> because I can't tell my mother. And then one of them, he wouldn't speak. And that was fine. I didn't care. And the next day when I came back, my mother said, this is a very good system. Now I can have my nap properly. Every day when you come, you sit here. So I was like, dude, anyway, then she said, yesterday, did you sit next to Sudhir? He is the one with no hair. And I said, yes. She said, you mustn't. You must sit two seats from him. I said, why? She said, because he will bite you. <laughs> yeah, I was like, he'll bite me. She said, huh, you know, bite. <laughs> what? I said, why? She said, because he's had very bad heroin smack. And he's very angry and he bites people. It will be okay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Don't be worried. Don't be scared But you see the man who's sitting over there Well, he's angry, so just take care He might bite you, he might bite you Bite me? Wow, okay, thanks for the heads up, Mum Oh, don't be silly, it's the least I could do Right, I'm going to go have my nap Nap? I'll only be an hour <laughs> Don't let them get away so basically, it sounds like in India, the, the conversations around sex were a lot more repressed or just non-existent. How does that differ with, with here? So I, mean, I came to the West when I was 21, yeah. you know, and I came to the West and I wanted a boyfriend and I kind of, I, by then I knew about sex. I don't know. Someone must have told me, maybe my friends told me. I can't really remember. I was thinking for this podcast, how did I find out? I actually didn't know how sex happened. I knew all the bits, but I didn't. Re I couldn't picture what it was until I was late into my teens. Really? Wow. Yeah, but it didn't bother me. 
Mm. I was about romance, not sex. Those are two very different things. If you watch a Bollywood movie, you'll go three hours and the romance is literally insane and no one's having sex. Mm. When I got here and I looked around me and I was at university with very bright English people, I couldn't, I was baffled by the absence of emotional connect Mm. and the massive run to fuck. I couldn't understand it. I was like, why? Yeah. Yeah, but you said in there that you didn't know how sex works. Like, you knew the bits of it, but... So I'm just so interested to find out, you know, how... Oh, God, I'm about to stumble into a pun here, but how you worked out the ins and outs of it. (laughs) I have a line from one of my comedy gigs, which is really very... It's based on the truth. I say, you know, in India, when it comes to sex, there is no theory you just show up one day for a practical and wing it. Mm. Mm. I had zero sexual self-confidence. Mm. Not because I tried it and it hadn't worked. I didn't fucking know what was going on. <laughs> yeah. mm. So I had, so what I did instead is I sort of built this huge edifice based on emotions and romance and thought, well, if I put this into a relationship, everything else will follow. Mm. And one of the great learnings of my life has been that you can have incredibly gratifying and very meaningful sex if there's a lot of emotion and romance Mm. and emotional intimacy. Mm. Yeah. But it's not necessary and sufficient sometimes. Wow. Mm. And the problem there then is for someone like me with zero sexual self-confidence when I was younger and you'd be in a relationship and everything was there, but it wouldn't work. You'd think I'm doing something wrong. Mm. So with that zero sexual self-confidence, what did that landscape look like for you, like a younger you? When I left India to study, I hadn't, I was supposed to have an arranged marriage. My mother was very strict. I had a lot of friends who were guys. Mm -hmm. I'd sort of had a kind of a dalliance with one person, had not had sex. And my mother found out about the dalliance. She didn't approve of the boy. So she told me in no uncertain terms. She said, I'll talk to his parents, but you, I'll get you married off. To the gardener's brother. Now, I want to put this in perspective. The gardener's brother was not well. He lived in the back of our house. He was nuts. He would run around the garden screaming, take off his clothes sometimes. I didn't want to marry that guy. Is this another one of your mother's threats? In oh, the same way that... Massive, massive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I mean, he was there and she said, <laughs> So it was so... Sc- and also my mother was someone who... She didn't make empty threats. She's, I don't ever remember her saying something and then you crossing that line and it not happening. Oh, my word. But also when she said that, I didn't think she would marry me off to the gardener's brother, but I knew she did not want me trapezing around town with this fellow because mm. it was bad for my reputation and I had to be married. But then to her great credit, the moment I left and I came abroad and my big plan was to have a boyfriend, I was like, I got to have sex because I don't want to have sex with just one person. I was always sexually curious. Mm. So I thought I got to have a series of boyfriends quickly and have lots of sex. I think I thought that, but the first boyfriend I had, I, I asked him if we were going to get married. The poor fellow got so scared, he ran away. Um, <laughs> I can't blame him, you know, I can't blame him. Yeah. But my mother never questioned that. She never said, don't do it. Mm. I think she knew I had boyfriends, even though I was meeting boys for marriage. I wouldn't tell her about the boyfriends. Mm. But I think my mother was happy that I was living my life sort of on my terms. Mm. But it was very important to her that I was not doing it in a way that was embarrassing, which meant that they could still keep looking for boys for me because I hadn't blown my reputation up, you know, which happened a lot, which could, which can happen. Because when you live in a way that's so different than what the cultural norms in India are, the parents have to answer for it. I have, I have yeah. several friends. When I was at University of Chicago, I had one friend. She was dating an, another Indian guy. She was living with him more or less. But she had, oh no, she was living with him, but she had two, they had two phone lines. So her parents had one number. And when that rang, everyone had to be quiet because they thought she lived alone. Wow. (laughs) And this went something out of a sitcom. That can't be real. Is that true? It is. And everyone was in their mid twenties and we thought it was fine because Mm. her parents would never approve of this boy. But you know, you got to do what you got to do. Mm. Because the other funny dichotomy, if you like, is that is your social reputation and your sexual reputation, because you're kind of talking about not being skilled and not knowing what to do. Yeah. And and, and I think there's an awful lot of pressure on people to to be good at sex. And I don't know how anybody, you know, whether they're whether they're Asian or not, is supposed to know how to do anything. It's something 
that you, you know, hopefully acquire in an intimate relationship where you're loved and cared about. But it's not that way for an awful lot of people. And there's this feeling that you have to perform, you have to have an orgasm, you have to be oh, good yeah. at giving your partner one, all of those things. And then you have to be demure and, and oh, keep yeah. your rep. Yeah, oh, 100%. really difficult. But the, the position that one gives one's sexual being in a relationship will define how stressed you are by that yeah. sexualness working or not. Mm. Because I have friends who've got married and their sex lives are awful and they don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. They don't know where to go. They don't know what to do. It's usually the woman's fault. But now if you watch this show on Netflix now, which is called Indian Matchmaking, the matchmaker openly says you need to have a good sexual chemistry. That's not something we ever heard. Mm. But, you know, India's opened up and that's very, very good. And I think that's becoming a huge part of it. Sometimes you would hear that a couple, I remember once my mother said to me when I was back in India on, on holiday, like she said to me, oh, you know that girl? And then she took the name of a girl. And you know, she had such a good marriage with that boy. But now they are divorce. Can you believe they are divorce? <laughs> and I, because divorce for Hindus, it's a huge issue. Mm. It's not in our religion per se, or uh, scratch that forget religion. It's not in our culture, but mm. it's in our legal system. But it's very, very traumatic for the whole family. So she said, yes, they're having a divorce. And I said, why? Well, she said, because I think something wrong with the boy. I thought maybe the boy had like, I don't know, alcoholism. No, it turns out they were a bad sexual match. And the girl was so lucky, quote unquote, that she was able to get out of it. You know, she said, I cannot tell her mother, but really I'm full of joy for her. It's a really interesting thing when you see um, South Asian couples coming for sex therapy. Quite often, they don't have, as you say, any idea of what they should be doing. And quite often, the women have unbelievable expectations about what the men should be capable of. And it's completely unrealistic and really sweet, but they, th th sometimes they're quite cross. Yeah. That the man can't, you know, go on for half an hour or whatever. Um, yeah. And that he doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know what to do any more than they know what to do. No. And yeah. I mean, this is not by no means everybody, but it is not an uncommon scenario here and, and now. Right, Sindhu, it's that time of the show where we like to ask our guests, how is it for you? What have you learnt? Is there anything you're taking away? Ah, this has been great. I think like a lot of things I've been doing in the last few months, this has really allowed me to delve into what I've learned from my mother mm. in a way that, you know, because most people don't walk up to me and say, hey, what about you and your mom and sex? How's the, what was <laughs> yeah. happening? Yeah. Uh, and that's very valuable to me. It's also, I think, as a married woman, when you talk about sex, it's always, are you having any? That's, mm. and then the, that's the conversation. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And yeah. which is, that, yes, I am. No, I'm not. We're on a holiday, blah, blah, blah. But to go back and try and come up with answers for you guys about what I was taught because I wasn't taught anything. Mm, mm. And I think for me, one of the great mysteries is how did I know? Like I'm seriously sitting here like, mm. who told me? Yeah. And I, I feel it makes me celebrate a little bit that network of women that I had around exactly. me that just, yeah. I don't know were they, my, my, my cousins, my friends, my friends, moms, my aunts, I don't know who told me. Yeah, so I, it's made me think of that and made me smile because I think that's something I've taken for granted, but it's kind of it's kind of crazy. Oh, that's such a nice takeaway to be like, it's my girls, it's my ladies who... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it's fabulous. It, 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 yeah, I mean, I don't know who told me. Well, Sindhu, thank you so much. Thank you. Lovely to meet you. Bye. Bye. It's the Mailbag, 10 Katie Queries. Two podcasts at hats.com. It's the mailbag. Thank Katie Queries podcast at hatchet with two C's. Hello there. I have a query for Kate. I would like to know when the real sex education mailbag starts. The real sex education mailbag starts right now. Thank you. Thanks so much again to Cindy V. What a great guest. Absolutely. Now it's time for us to open our mailbag and ask Mum some questions that listeners have sent in for her via email to podcasts at hatchet.com or on Twitter via the hashtag. Hashtag real sex edu. So let's get started. The first one is from Anonymous and they ask, Though we look forward to holidays, there always seems to be an increase in the tension between me and my partner. How can we avoid that this year? Oh, that's, that's interesting. Um, it, it's true 
that a lot of people are much more likely to come back from holiday with relationship problems than they went on holiday with them. Can I just stop you quickly? Because that feels different to a couple of weeks ago we talked about how i suppose this is more sex but it's like we have great sex we're on holiday so yes how the, how do those two things coexist you know one side of it is way better when you're on holiday yeah. and one side of it is way worse yeah yeah so some people relax when they're on holiday and they're able to relax and be themselves together but for other people the tension that's been growing throughout the year then reaches a crescendo, mm. particularly if couples haven't been communicating well before they went and they haven't planned. And there are spikes in divorce and calls to therapy. Shortly after Christmas, so in January, mm. um, there's divorce days in January, and in September, and in sort of June after all the bank holidays, May, June. Mm. So we know that people often have problems. And sometimes, you know, it's a whole cluster of family things all coming together and perhaps other family members also being in the mix and it just makes for a whole load of tension. But if you plan properly, it doesn't need to happen. So rather than going on holiday thinking, well, fingers crossed it won't happen this year, think about what usually goes wrong. Think about what you want to do and discuss it so that you have the same expectations mm. for the holiday. Mm. So, you know, if you're one partner who wants to be out seeing museums and things all the time and the other one wants to be around the pool... You need to talk about that before you go rather than getting annoyed with one another and really, really plan it so that you, it's not just a question of each of you saying, well, you're just thwarting me. You're just being difficult and irritating. Um, similarly, you know, if one expects sex every night and the other one just wants a rest, that might be a problem too. So you've got to discuss what you're expecting so that you're both not feeling that the other is being deliberately difficult because the other can't mind read. And quite often expectations for holidays are completely different. Excellent. Uh, we have another one from Alice who asks, I'm 22 and recently started to notice sharp abdominal pain that comes and goes for a couple of days between periods. This month, I also had a little spotting. I'm finding this frightening. Please tell me it's nothing to worry about. Mum, before you go on and answer this, can you tell us what spotting is and then proceed to put Alice at ease? <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit of bleeding that probably appears as spots on your underwear. Mm, okay. um, so probably there is nothing to worry about. But as always, if you have any change in your body's behaviour, you should get it checked out. But what I actually think is happening here is that she's experiencing something known as Mittelschmerz, which is... When in the middle of the month, when you ovulate, you get some pain and sometimes a bit of spotting because of the alteration in hormones, you get a bit of breakthrough bleeding. And for some people, it's so heavy, they think it's a period. And this is how people sometimes say they get pregnant during a period because they've had enough bleeding middle of the month to make them think they're having a period. But actually, it's this Mittelschmerz. It's quite common. And sometimes people have it for a while and it goes away or have it occasionally it's it's just one of those things. Some people have it and some don't. So your your advice to Alice would be, don't worry, it's maybe that if if it happens regularly. Well, it is happening regularly. Mm. So I think she should oh, get she it checked. That, yeah. To, yeah, get get it checked out just to be on the safe side. But I think this is going to turn out to be what it is. It's going to turn out to be, say that lovely word again. Mittelschmerz. Fantastic stuff. That is the word of the day, everyone. It is. <laughs> And that's what we have time for. Thank you so much Aww. again. I know. Thank you so much again to the fantastic Cindy V for taking the time to speak to us. Thank you so much to Kate Campbell for guiding us along the way. Thanks, Mum. Cheers, Diggs. And thank you, that's you, for listening. See you next time and next week for more Real Sex Education. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Real Sex Education, which is hosted by Diggory Waite and Kate Campbell. The show is produced by Andy Goddard and Diggory Waite. The Real Sex Education is a Hattrick podcast. If you'd like to hear more podcasts by Hattrick, including Time Ghost with Alexander Armstrong and Ben Miller, just search Hattrick Podcasts on your podcast provider of choice. This podcast is based on the real-life relationship between the host Diggory Waite and his mother, accredited sex therapist Kate Campbell. The show is therefore inspired by but otherwise unrelated to the TV show Sex Education. But yes, Diggory does wish his co-host was Gillian Anderson. 